Let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your holy presence in the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ this evening. Holy Father, you have been with us these past three days. And you have spoken unto us through all your speakers, your servants, the prophets, whom you sent to this nation for such a time as this, that we may hear what God is speaking to this nation. And you have brought your dear children from far and near, from all over this nation, and even from afar off, that they may know the seasons and the times in which they are living. That has been appointed over this great nation. Now one more time we ask you, O oh Lord our God, that you will speak to us tonight. You showed the Apostle John Things that were, things that are, and things that are going to happen shortly. Now we pray, you will show us likewise the destiny of this nation and what lies ahead. What should we do that we may stand uncondemned before you? What must we do that we may stand justified before you? And what must we do that we may find favor in your eyes? So now we pray, Lord, you will make your ways known to us. We humbly present ourselves to you. Spirit of the living God, Open our hearts, open our ears, give us an understanding heart, give us a listening ear, that we may hear what the Spirit of God is speaking to the churches in these last days. In the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ, we pray, Amen. Please be seated. One more time, on behalf of all the speakers, we want to thank the Come Lord Jesus Committee for their kindness to invite us for the fourth time. I hope you all are not getting tired of us. No. Not getting any bored? No. See, when you go out to eat, you don't like to eat the same food every time, right? You always want to experiment. In the same way, won't you get tired of seeing our faces? If not for others, at least my face. No? You are okay with us? You love us? How much? Thank you. Even if I don't bring you a good word tonight, you will still love me? Yes. Really? Yes. That makes me feel very sad. <laughs> you know, I'm always given a very hard task. So much so now, I have decided not to go to any church to preach. I don't always bring good news to the churches. It's always with a whip. So after, I had a very, very heartbreaking experience in Malaysia very recently. So after that, I, I sat and pondered, I should no more go to speak in any church. But here we are, but this is not a church. This is a combined conference. So we are in safe ground. <laughs> right? So you don't have to feel threatened. But nevertheless, the Bible tells us one thing. God chastens 
only those whom he loves he doesn't chasten everybody he only chastens those whom he loves you know a few days ago i watched a video clip on the youtube see thank god for the youtube <laughs> of a tv program that was aired in the us by a great man of god in the us called jim baker so there was this tv program where he interviewed rick joiner and this was just after the great massive hurricane that came and brought a flood of waters all over the city of houston so while they were talking about that issue jim baker asked rick joiner a question why do you think a good loving god permits all this or chastens us and i was just looking at uh, rick joiner what he would answer and you know brother joiner was a very composed he was very composed and uh, he looked very calm and then he gave this very wise answer he said america was a nation that was dedicated to god by her founding fathers so the nation was totally dedicated to god meaning the nation belongs to god so if the nation belongs to god it's god's child is god's son or god's daughter and when when the son goes astray then every good father will chasten the son right every good father will do that no good father will just keep mum to see their children going away in bad ways do you do that when your children go in bad ways do you say hallelujah praise the lord <laughs> do you do that no you either discipline them or you counsel them you don't just let them go their own ways that's not what a good father does and bad father or adopted father may do that so god who has adopted or taken into himself the nation of the us so when she went astray he disciplined her to bring her back to himself that's the purpose of discipline am i right it's redemptive not beat you to hell the scripture says very clearly no every good father disciplines a child so that the soul can be safe even when god hands us over into the hands of satan the scripture says very clearly that is a last act of a judgment or chastisement so that your soul can be safe the flesh is put to death but your soul can be safe if not who knows what greater evil your end will be one good example is the life of samson during his imprisonment he repented you know i think this is just my guess there's no black and white scripture for all that from the time he was blinded and put in prison and from the time that he prayed lord strengthen me one more time it is my guess that about a year could have passed because his hair grew it must have taken a, at least a year for the hair to grow hairs don't grow overnight do they no do no, they don't they take time to grow right you see samson's anointing light on his hair that was the covenant between him and god so when he prayed lord remember me one more time strengthen me one more time now his hair has grown 
his covenant with God has been restored. And the Lord poured the anointing upon Samson one more time. He was restored back to his call. He was restored back with his anointing. And with one mighty push, the entire amphitheater in the in Philistine came crushing down. And everybody seated in the amphitheater or like the stadium that you have in Sydney today, like the Olympic Stadium. The whole stadium comes crumpling down and every single person dies. Including Samson. See, he was restored, but he died. He did not leave to continue his ministry again. Why? Perhaps God in his wisdom may have seen to let him leave, something worse can happen. So his flesh was killed so that his soul can live. So God in his great, great love even does that today. So by now you should get the idea where I'm coming next. But don't worry. I <laughs> I prayed very much that I'll be a good boy today. <laughs> so, on this last night, I bring you good news. Even bad news is good news, you know. <laughs> Are you ready? Yes. On the 6th of September, as I was praying the whole day, when I finished my prayer at 5 in the evening, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared before me. And this was the word that he spoke about Australia. He said, they should prepare for the revival that is going to be poured out in their nation. Is that good news? Yes. See, I told you I'll be good. <laughs> now listen. The word of the Lord is this. They should prepare for the revival that is going to be poured out in this nation nation. Now all of you, all the churches in Australia, you have been praying and seeking God for the promised revival. Am I right everybody? Yes. For years and years and years you've been praying and praying and praying. Now God tells you, now get ready. Now get ready. If God says get ready, it means it's around the corner. So what is this revival that is going to come. In the year 1927, exactly 90 years from today, a great man of God called Smith Bigglesworth came to Sydney. During his ministry in Sydney, this was the word the Lord spoke through him and he prophesied these words. Australia, you have been chosen by God for a great move of the Holy Spirit. This move of God will be the greatest move of God ever known in mankind's history. It will start a great revival in Australia, spread throughout the whole world, and usher in the second coming of Jesus. You clap your hands too soon. <laughs> the next sentence is the best of all. This will be the final revival before the coming of the Lord.
Now look at this. The final revival upon the face of the whole world and it starts in Australia. What, what a greatly privileged people you are. See? You know, the sun shines in the east. It rises up in the east, right? So all the nations in the east sees the sun first before the nations in the west. In the same manner, the nations that's on the far east is Australia. That is a nation of promise. You are like Isaac, a son of promise. So when the Lord comes, see, the sun comes in the east first. So when the revival comes, you will be the first nation to see the revival. So the cloud of glory will be poured upon this nation. And after it has flooded this nation, then from here, it will go out to the rest of the world. See, this is your promise. This promise was given in 1927. 90 years till to date. And you have been waiting for 90 years for this prophecy spoken by a true prophet of God, an apostle of faith, a true man of God, not like, not any bogus man or bogus prophets who gives out word for money. You know, what one identification mark of a true servant of God is they don't care about money. They don't even promote themselves. Even though they may have books, they don't even talk about themselves. One excellent example is Dr. Bruce Allen. He has several books. In the many conferences that we have done together, I've never ever seen him talking about his books. Even though when I nudge him many times. <laughs> Come on, go and talk about your books. He doesn't do that. And that goes together with Reverend Neville Johnson. We have known each other since the year 1993 and done many conferences together in the US and he has many, many wonderful, great teachings on DVDs, on MP3s and on CDs. And in all these 20 some years, I've never seen him ever put up his CD and promoted them. Or I ever spoke a word saying, support my ministry. See, these are, that does not mean they don't, you don't need to support their ministry. <laughs> that does not mean they have tons of money and they don't need any support. So please support these wonderful ministries. Right? You know, I'm a foreigner. Dr. Bruce Allen is a foreigner. But Reverend Neville Johnson is a prophet that God has raised up in this land. See how so blessed you are to have a great prophet of God who walks with God like Enoch had walked. You know, you have never seen Enoch, have you? Because if you ever claim that you have seen him, you should be at least 4,000 years old. <laughs> and you must have gone through many, many Botox operations. And I'm sure you're not 4,000 years old, all right? Okay, so you have never seen him. But every time when I look at this man, the, the spirit and the power that was upon him truly rests upon him. Not only I can say this through our personal relationship, but also what I have been shown about him in heaven his spiritual stature. So I'm always very, very proud of our friendship and doubly proud because God raised him in this land of the great Southland. 
Is that all you can give? You know what's the rightful thing to do? Stand up to your feet. Give a good. He has a great and awesome call of God upon his life, which will manifest very largely in these last days. So you must pray for him. All of you, every Australian's responsibility, pray much for him and his lovely wife, Josephine. And his lovely son, handsome son, is also in our midst. Where are you, Mark? Just put up your hand. Right there. Even if you don't pray for yourselves, you should pray for Brother Neville Johnson. <laughs> Please be seated. So, with this word of promise that we have, now the question is, how to prepare for the revival, for the glory of God that is going to be poured out in this nation? So this is the question. Because the Lord said, prepare. You should now get ready. Prepare. How to prepare? Now this is how the Lord counseled. So whatever I'm going to share with you now, is exactly as I have heard it from the Lord. Now the Lord gave me several examples from the Old Testament and the New Testament, whereby we can look at principles from revivals that had taken place in both Testaments. Let's look at the Old Testament first. In 2 Chronicles chapter 5, you will read about King Solomon having built a magnificent temple for the Lord. Having done it, the day came to dedicate it. Now, if you read the whole chapter 5, it details very specifically the various process, how they prepared before the cloud of God's glory was poured out upon Solomon's temple. The cloud of glory coming down is the revival that broke out in Solomon's temple. See, when the cloud of glory manifests, it just doesn't come like a thick cloud resting upon you, but it manifests the power and the glory of God. If you were not here on the second night, you missed a great, wonderful message by Brother Neville Johnson. He shared about what happened when King David set up his tabernacle. He was graced by God to see that event. And he saw the tabernacle of David, a very unassuming tent that was pitched on Mount Zion. And in the tent was the Ark of the Covenant. And it said that as soon as the Ark was brought into the tabernacle, light and colors came out from the Ark and shone around the entire valley of Jerusalem. Like how sun rays, rays will come out of the sun. And everyone who came under the rays of the glory were instantly healed. Every sick person were all who climbed up the mount before they could even reach the tabernacle. When they come within the perimeter of the glory of God, they were healed. And whatever blessings they needed, they received. You know, before the ark was brought to Mount Zion, 
the ark was for a few months, three months, in the home of one man called Obed. And the Bible says, just because the ark was in his house, the Lord blessed his household. Because there was glory that came out from the ark, it blessed every person in the house. In the same manner, the ark of God in the Old Testament is the glory of God that will come down in the New Testament in these days. So the glory of God was going to come down during the time when Solomon's temple was dedicated. So what did they do? So I encourage you to read 2 Chronicles chapter 5. We're not going to do it right now, but let's look at a few scriptures in that chapter. Please turn with me now to your traditional Bibles. That is paper and ink Bible. To Second Chronicles chapter 5. If you have a digital version, just swipe it. Okay, look at verse 11. Principle number 1. They, and it came to pass when the priests came out of the most holy place. For all the priests were present had sanctified themselves. Now before the actual event of the worship started, the priests were in the temple waiting on God. Principle number one, they waited on God to ask him how they should minister unto him. You don't just pick up some songs. Now we have wonderful worship teams. Today we had a great worship, right? Not only today, every day we had wonderful worship from all the worship teams that are present here. Not only here, all over the world. But most of them, there's always a set time. 30 minutes for worship. Or 40 minutes for worship. Or 50 minutes of worship. And at the stroke of the 30th minute, the pastor walks up with the microphone to say, Hallelujah, Amen. That's a signal. <laughs> Am I right, everybody? See, that is the anointed way. How they give a signal, let the worship now stop or die down. So it doesn't matter if the Holy Spirit wants to move in the worship. It doesn't matter because we are more interested in our pet programs. Because we have a scheduled, a regimental order of service. You know, when I was born again, I attended a very, very traditional denominational church. And the entire worship service lasts exactly 60 minutes. You know, not a minute more. As soon as all the congregants are inside the ch church, at the stroke of 11, the pastor will begin with the opening prayer. You know, all the entire service with these timings are all printed on the bulletin. And I've actually watched my watch and watched the pastor. They always do it to the T. How in the world they can really do it to the T was a mystery to me. Their prayer is exactly telemate for five minutes. Not a second more. And then they sing two hymns. And then after that, an offering. And then a hymn. And then some announcements. And the sermon for the day is 20 minutes. If for some reason, the pastor got a little carried away that particular day. Just a minute or two minutes longer. Everybody in the congregation will look at their watches.
I was an eyewitness of all this. Once I was invited to speak at a very orthodox Anglican church in the northern part of India in a state called Sikkim. And they followed this regiment. And uh, the pastor who invited me, he's a reverend doctor. And he told me, he said, Sadhuji, your message time is 15 minutes. And the message need to be interpreted. <laughs> so I looked at my watch. All right, I have 15 minutes. So I need to preach for 12 minutes so that I can pray for the people for three minutes. So if I preach for 12 minutes, I should actually preach only for six minutes because my interpreter needs six minutes. So I said, that's fine, Pastor. I am always very obedient whenever I go to speak in a local church. I always tell the pastor he is my boss and I'm very obedient. So I started my message. Before I could go beyond the appetizer, <laughs> time was up. <laughs> so I kept my watch right before my eyes. Even right now I'm doing it. <laughs> so I told the congregation, let's all stand up for a word of prayer. And I prayed and I said, Amen. <laughs> and I went and sat down. The whole congregation was in a shock. They thought, what happened to me? And when I prayed, they all really thought I was just praying the opening prayer. <laughs> they never realized that I actually finished when the pastor came up to give the benediction. So later on, they, many of them came and asked me, why did you preach so short? That's not your nature. I have a great reputation to preach for a minimum of three hours. <laughs> I live up to that reputation. So tonight being a Saturday, <laughs> and being the last day of the conference, <laughs> is it okay everybody? <laughs> So, everything is regimental. So even if the Holy Spirit wants to move, we said, please stop. <laughs> Time's up. <laughs> or you're not allowed. Right? See, these are patterns of the old. If you want God to move in your midst, you know what's the first thing you need to do? Throw away this watch. <laughs> and the second thing you need to throw is throw away your mobile phones. <laughs> That's another great evil in society today. Not only you come to the church, the devil comes along with you. <laughs> in the form of your mobile phones. Not only God speaks to you, even the devil speaks to you through the mobile phones. It rings everywhere. See, you have come to the house of God to hear God. Not to hear your mobile phones ringing. As soon as you step into the house of God, the first thing that you should do is switch off your mobile phones. You should never hear the ringing of the mobile phones. You have come into the house of God and the scripture says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all flesh keep silent. And we should add another word. Let all flesh and mobile devices <laughs> keep silent. You know, this is not a laughing matter. And this is not comical either. You yourselves are guilty of the very thing that you are laughing about. So you're not laughing at my statement, you're laughing at your own self. Because you are guilty of the same thing. So the priests, 
the Levites, they were cloistered in a room before the service started and they waited on God for the Lord to anoint them and tell them what songs they should sing. See, you don't just simply sing any songs. The scripture says you must sing the songs of the Lord. To sing the songs of the Lord, you must get those songs from heaven. Or from anointed psalmies that we have today. And those songs are songs that the Lord gives you. And the Lord will tell you exactly how you should do the worship service. How long it should go. Or how short it should go. So we must learn this. To throw away your programs. If you want to prepare for revival, start practicing in your church every time. Amen. Number two, principle number two. In verse 13, you will read, when they began to sing, they thanked the Lord, they lifted up their voice to praise the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. See, that is a new worship. You don't sing the old songs all the time. The scripture says, Sing unto the Lord a new song. So when you come before the Lord, when you are cloistered, secluded at the back of the church, waiting on God, He gives you a new song. He gives you a new tune. He gives you a new praise. And you come. And when you sing those songs, the glory of God comes down. Because the songs that God gives you are the very songs that the angels sing in heaven. Are the very songs that the redeemed sing in heaven. So what you are doing, you are just a conduit. You are like a satellite dish that receives the signals directly from heaven. And you are broadcasting them back into your own local church. A new song. That's what they did before the glory of God came down. And this is what we should do. God is going to pour out a new anointing of praise and worship that is unlike never before anything that has happened in this world before. You know, as we enter into the last days, we cannot be singing the same old songs. You will be singing new songs that are pertinent to the end times. In the end times, the Lord God will manifest like the Lion of Judah. He's the warrior king. So if he's going to come like the warrior king, how are you going to praise the warrior king? How are you going to worship the warrior king? We must learn that. And that can only happen if the worship team are going to spend their time secretly in prayer. You don't rush the last minute and then hurriedly put your back by the stage and then quickly take your guitar and then you sing, ting, ting, ting. <laughs> you know, one of the greatest mysteries of this world that I've never ever come to understand is this. Every guitarist, when they come up to the stage, as soon as they take the guitar, they must ting, ting. Everyone, even though it's already tuned. <laughs> I'm not a musician, so I don't know. Maybe they know better. So new worship. So every worship leader, every person in the worship team must learn to have a relationship with God so that you can be infused with new songs from heaven. Thirdly, verse 13 again tells us that all the musicians and all the singers and all the worshippers, 
they were of one mind. Every one of them. If their instruments are not all tuned together, at least all their hearts were tuned together. They were all of one heart and one accord. Even the congregation, they were not looking up the ceiling, looking for spiders. <laughs> Many do today, you know. They look up and count how many lights there are on the ceiling. You don't do that. All hearts are locked in oneness. In that atmosphere was when the glory of God was poured out. And the reason why, you know, I have pondered many, many times over many years. Today, in the new covenant, every musician is anointed with the Holy Spirit. Every worship leader is anointed with the Holy Spirit. Then why is it that we don't see the Shekinah cloud of glory coming down in our services? Why? In the old covenant, it was not like that. But in the old covenant, we read, the glory of God came down like a thick cloud. Everybody could touch it and feel it. What's the difference? The difference is this. They were all of one accord. They were not divided in their hearts. The worship leader knew exactly what song to sing. And the musicians knew exactly what key to pick. They don't need to ask the singer what key. You know, once I went to a church, a church camp. And uh, I have a great gift for singing. <laughs> great gift. And the special anointing that I have, no one else in this world has that. So, and that particular anointing is only for singing. So, after my message that morning, uh, that evening, I looked at the keyboard player and I asked that young girl, I said, my dear daughter, do you know this particular song? She said, yes, uncle, I know that. I said, all right. I'm going to, I, before my prayer, I'm going to sing that song and you just play. So I asked everybody to stand up and they were all still and quiet. And this girl whispered to me, uncle, uncle, key. <laughs> so I looked at her and I touched my pocket. I looked at my hand. The key is still with me. <laughs> so I told her, yes, I have the key. <laughs> so I closed my eyes again. And I encouraged the congregation, come on, everybody keep quiet now. <laughs> and again, she whispered, uncle, uncle, key, key. <laughs> so I looked at her. I said, I have the key. <laughs> so... Again, uh, I was trying to quieten myself. And again, she whispered, Uncle, Uncle. I looked at her and she showed me, you know, those, all the keys on the piano. She said, key, key. <laughs> oh, I thought, oh my, that key. Oh. <laughs> what am I going to tell her now? <laughs> so I told her, Z key. And I closed my eyes real tight. And I didn't want to turn and look at her. So I sang the song. And I could hear her playing. Ping. And I finished singing the song. And um, so the prayer was over. Everybody was dismissed. And uh, I never stood back to shake hands with anybody because she's going to ask me <laughs> about the key. So I ran as fast as I could. <laughs> so later on, while we were having our dinner, I asked the pastor, who is that keyboard player who doesn't know this key? <laughs> and he told me, you know, he said that girl, she's an eighth grade piano teacher a graduate of 
Trinity School of Music from London. I said, oh my God. <laughs> so I have been playing with a eighth grade piano teacher. So later on, I met her by the hallway. I asked her, you know, you are such a learned person and you're a teacher who teaches piano. You should know better. There's no such thing as a set key. <laughs> so why did you go along with what I said? You know what she answered me? She said, oh, you know, uncle, you always go to heaven. So I thought that key is in heaven. <laughs> So, don't be like me. <laughs> All right? That's why I told you, see, no one has my special anointing. <laughs> so, it is very, very important for the worship team to fast once a week. In our ministry, we have a small worship team. And this is the mandate I give to them. You must practice at least once a week. And then fast and pray together once a week before you come and stand to minister in the public meetings. All of the singers and the musicians must be of one heart, one mind. So the anointing can flow through you to touch the congregation. Worship prepares the way for the glory of God to come. So it is very, very vital and all of them were one heart, one mind. What does that signify? They, they had no envy or ego among them. I can play better. I can sing better. There may be a several singers. No one has any envy. It doesn't matter who sings better. God gets the glory. Amen. And the third principle is... They sought God with the whole heart and worship God out of a pure heart. They worship God's majesty, goodness, and greatness. There are so many songs that we sing today in our churches that are practically rubbish. Because there's no praise in the songs. There are no worship in the songs. They are largely... Bless me, God songs. Make me feel good songs. There's no praise, there's no worship in the songs. You sing two good songs and the other two songs are just about me. Bless me, God. I want to seek you. I want to get you. See, we should get rid of all those songs and sing good old hymns. There are many, many good charismatic songs that are written by great, wonderful, true lovers of God. You know, you can tell the difference from the songs that the author is a true lover of God. He truly loved God and the songs that he wrote came out of a broken relationship with God, a broken heart that pours out an offering unto God. You can tell the difference by the lyrics. You can tell the difference. Those that are written for money and those who are written just as a pure offering unto God. So pick those songs and sing love songs to our Savior. Everyone from the king to the ordinary people gathered to worship at the appointed time. They all were punctual for their service. No one came late like we do today. See, that shows an attitude of irreverence. This must change. This must change. When they did all right, Verse 14 tells us, 
the cloud of glory came down so thick not only it was so thick every levite priest and singers who were standing there worshiping god they all fell down under the power of god they could not stand they all fell down so this slain in the spirit is not a charismatic thing it goes way back in the old testament second example from the old testament in first kings chapter 18 you will read about the prophet elijah preparing the people to experience the glory of god you know when elijah made this sacrifice and fire came down and not only fire came down but the glory of god was made visible and the scripture says in first kings chapter 18 verses 38 and 39 that all israel saw with their eyes the glory of god that came down in the form of fire it was not just the prophet elijah who saw that but everyone they saw the glory of god when we worship right before god everybody in the congregation will see the glory of god not one not two all eyes when the glory that is going to come the mighty revival that will sweep this great nation all eyes in australia will see the glory so for that we need to prepare now how did elijah prepare his people first kings chapter 18 verse 21 tells us he confronted the people with one question how long will you be of double mind that was the question how long and the word double mind in the hebrew it conveys this concept how long will you swing between two opinions it's like a monkey swinging from tree to tree how long will you do that how long how long are you going to swing between two opinions how long are you also going to worship the idols and at the same time the god of israel how long that's what the problem was in that day they were worshiping two gods they were going to the temple of baal they bow down and they worship baal and then they come to the temple of the holy god and they offer sacrifices and incense to the holy god they were like what the bible calls today in revelation chapter 3 verses 15 to 17 the laodicean church problem you're not hot not cold you are dangling between two opinions the lord jesus said how long will you swing between two opinions either you be hot or you be cold choose which camp you want to be don't swing and be lukewarm you know warm water is good to drink cold water is good to drink but lukewarm water you will warm it out it's not fit to drink so that's what the lord jesus said i will warm it you out you know how dangerous that position is i pondered very much and meditated that scripture i want you to think like this for someone to vomit something it must have first gone inside right when i'm sure you have experienced vomiting haven't you you don't vomit when you're still chewing food in your mouth do do you that is not called vomiting that's called spitting out you just throw the food out but when you warm it the food has already gone inside you and then from within your stomach you pull the food out and you vomit it that's what it means right everybody now listen for the lord jesus to say i will vomit you it means you are inside him now and he takes you out 
and vomit you out. Which means you lose your salvation. You are no more inside him. You are now vomited out. You don't want that to happen to you, do you? How long will you be of double mind? Even the prophet Moses, during his time, asked his people the same question. In Exodus chapter 33, sorry, chapter 32 verse 26, he asked the people after they had made a golden calf, he asked the question, who are on the Lord's side? Come and stand on my right side. Sadly, only the tribe of Levi came and stood by his right side. Several thousands of people perish by the fires of God. And the prophet John the Baptist, he too urged the people to turn back to God. In Luke chapter 3 verse 7, he says, Flee from the wrath to come. Flee! That was a warning. After revival comes a judgment. You know, after the Lord Jesus Christ comes, the scripture says, he will rule the world with a rod of iron. Have you ever pondered if all the saints who are looking for the coming of the Lord and they are there to receive the Lord and all of them are saints, why should the Lord use a rod of iron to rule the saints of God? Why? Saints don't need a rod of iron. They need a scepter, right? A kingly scepter. The rod of iron is there because there will be ungodly nations still on this world after the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it is those people whom the Lord will rule over with an iron rod, which means with a discipline, right? That's what an iron rod is. So if you're not on the Lord's side, then you are going to be on the enemy's camp. If you're on the enemy's camp and you become the Lord's enemy, you don't even want to imagine to be an enemy of the Lord. So what does all this mean? Singleness of mind is required to serve and worship God. This is something that is required in today's church. Singleness of mind, singleness of devotion is required. You decide today whom you want to serve. You want to serve mammon or serve the living God? You want to serve yourself or you want to serve the living God? Now this is the counsel of the Lord. The church must completely turn away from idols, pet sins, hidden sins, and back to loving God with a truthful and faithful heart. Three kinds of sins. One, idols. But two, pet sins. But three, hidden sins. And turn back to loving God with all your heart, with all your soul. Now let's look at a New Testament example. In Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 14, we read of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ who were seekers after the promise of God. See, now we are studying about how we should prepare ourselves for the promised revival that is going to come upon this nation. So the disciples were seekers after God's promise. What promise? Now please turn your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 1. And let's read verses 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, 
he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now that was the promise. In Luke chapter 3 verse 21, we read that when the Lord Jesus Christ came out of the water, before he walked out of the water, before the duff came upon him, we read that he was praying. What was he praying? What, why was he praying? Or what was he praying for? You know, this denominational church that I attended, I told you earlier, they don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the pastor, very, my pastor was a wonderful, wonderful, prayerful man. So he taught me through the Bible, three month of Bible study before baptism. And most of the Bible studies all about their church doctrines. Nothing about the Bible. All the churches doctrines do's and don'ts. So I memorized all those doctrines and then he said, just as the Lord Jesus was baptized, when he came out of the water, the Holy Spirit came upon him. In the same manner, when you come out of the water, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. So you, he asked me, do you understand? I said, yes, sir, I understood. So the day of my baptism came, March the 3rd, 1979. So after all these formalities of vows were all over, I, I can't remember whether I was the first person or the second person wearing a black robe signifying death, I suppose. <laughs> so I was led into the water. And when I came out of the water, I honestly, you know what's the first thing I did? I looked up <laughs> because the dove was coming. So I looked up, I didn't see any duff. And my pastor said, okay, go out now. So I came out of the water. So no duff came. So I thought to myself, what happened to the duff? <laughs> because we read from the life of the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit came upon him like a duff. So where's the duff? See, in all my naiveness, I believe to the letter what the scripture said. Even today I do that. I believe to the letter what the scripture says. So then I, I, I questioned my pastor, Pastor, where's the duff? Oh, he said, that is all spirit. Your eyes cannot see. It just came. I said, okay, spirit. All right. Now, the Lord Jesus was praying. What was he praying? He was praying the promise of the Father concerning him. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 to 3. It is said of him, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon me. So he prayed for that. He said, Father, it is promised that the Spirit, the seven spirits will rest upon me. Let it come. He prayed. He sought the promise. And after that, the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. When he was about to be taken up to heaven, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when he spoke to his disciples, wait in Jerusalem. Don't rush anywhere for ministry. Wait until you be endured with power from on high. The Holy Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 6 that more than 500 people heard that message. More than 500. So how many more than 500? We don't know. But because the Apostle Paul said there were 500, let's take that minimum number. So 500 heard the command of the Lord to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit to come. And then we read... In Acts chapter 1 verse 15, that 120 waited for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now 500 
heard the command. But only 120 acted on the command. What happened to the 380? What happened? So why the 380 were not found in the upper room praying continually for 10 days for the promise to come? Why were they not there? Why only 120 were there? You know what's the answer? Only 120 were willing to pay the price. 380 were just mere spectators. They were people who say, bless me God, that's it. They are not willing to pay the price. They are not willing to fast and pray. They are not willing to tarry in the presence of God. Because to tarry in the presence of God, you cannot name the time. In Exodus chapter 24, verses 15 to 18, you'll read that God called Moses to come and wait on him. And Moses waited for six long days up on Mount Sinai, and the Lord did not show up at all. What would you have done? If you were there that day, you would have looked at your clock. Hmm. Five minutes, nobody shows up. Okay, let me give you another five minutes. Ten minutes, nobody comes. And, and you say to yourself, okay, I'll give God another five minutes. Fifteen minutes, God doesn't come. You will just pack all your backpack and come down the mountain. Won't we do that? But look at the prophet Moses. He waited on the mount. You know, for many years, I pondered in my heart, what made him wait? And then recently, I found the answer. He waited because the Lord said, come and wait. <laughs> Period. The Lord did not say how long. He said, come and wait. You know, there lived a wonderful man of God in England called Walter Butler. Have you heard of him? This man is a great teacher of the word and also a man great in the spirit. One day, the Lord told him, Walter, I feel very lonely. Can you come and wait on me? And uh, Walter looked at his schedule and he told the Lord, Yes, Lord, I can, but I am only free. From now, he was very, he was not saying it pridefully, he was saying with all humility. He was a Bible school president, principal, teacher, traveling around the whole world. So he said, Lord, I'm only free from two in the morning right up to five in the morning. And he said, I covenant with you, Lord. I will come and wait on you and keep you company. So he made a covenant. So the following day, he got up at 2 o'clock, sat on his chair before the Lord, and he said, Lord, I have come to wait on you. And from 2 in the morning right up to 5 in the morning, he will just sit there and wait for the Lord. Never expecting anything. Just to keep the Lord company. One day, two day, three day, four day, 12 months passed by and it became a life habit for him. At the end of 12 months, one day, as was his custom, he sat down on his chair to wait on the Lord and he saw someone opening the door. Now who would open the door at two in the morning? And the door opened and in walked the Lord Jesus. He saw the Lord Jesus with his naked eyes. And the Lord Jesus walked into his room, sat on the chair that was appointed for the Lord, and he told him, 
because you have faithfully waited on me for 12 months every day without fail from this day onwards you'll always see me with your eyes and wherever you go i will come with you i don't know why you are clapping that for walter he's already gone to glory So just like that, you know, God told Moses, come and wait. That's all the Lord told him. The Lord didn't tell him, wait for two minutes or wait for three minutes. Say, wait. That's why I told you earlier, if you want to prepare for glory, for revival to come in your church, the first thing that you must do, throw away your watches. Don't dictate to God when he should come, when he should leave. You can have an appointed time for your church service, but don't tell God when to end the service. This is our problem. So only 120 sought the Lord for the promise. So what happened to the majority? So this tells us there will always only be a small remnant who will truly seek the Lord. And the rest will find excuses to give to God why they cannot wait on Him. So here is the counsel of the Lord. Seek the promises God gave to your nation. Seek the promises. What are the promises? I gave you one by Smith Wigglesworth. There is another one which I will share with you later. And pray ardently, reminding God of his promise. In Isaiah 43, verse 26, the Lord tells us to remind him, to put him in remembrance. Say, Lord, you promise, therefore grant us. He said that you promise. Therefore, grant. The second example that I want to bring before you is, the disciples were all united together with one goal, with one purpose. Acts chapter 1 verse 14. They were all with one accord. In their hearts, there was only one motive, to seek the promise. Nothing else came between them and the promise of God. No food, no sleep, no rest, nothing mattered. <coughs> All that matters to them was, they must have this promise. So what does that speak of? Thirsting and hungering after righteousness. That is one of the B attitudes. Blessed are they who thirst and hunger after righteousness. So the question now comes is, <coughs> excuse me, do you thirst and hunger after righteousness? Sometimes why the promise is delayed? Because we are not ready. That's a simple reason. There's no other reason. We are not ready. If God poured out his glory, when we are not ready, that glory will kill you. Instead of reviving you, it will kill you. A good example is, when God told Moses to prepare the people, his glory was going to come down. In Exodus chapter 19, he told him very specifically, put markers all around Mount Sinai so that no man, not even an animal, come near and touch the mountain. If anyone does, the glory will kill them. Because animals were not fasting and praying. They did not wash their clothes. They did not stay away from sexual relationships, which were required by God. 
And if they had come near, the glory would have killed them. The same manner when a man called Uzzah stretched out his hand to stop the ark from falling over. See, the glory of God from the ark came out like a fire and killed him. Why? Uzzah was not a priest. Only priests are called to bear the ark. He was not a priest. So the glory killed him. Whereas when the priests carried the ark on their shoulders, the glory did not touch them. The glory covered them. So when we are not prepared, the glory will kill us. That is why God in his great mercy waits on us. But there is time also for that grace to wait. So the disciples were united with one goal, one purpose. What does that mean? Be bonded together. Be yoked together with one hope. One hope of the promise of the Father. Now this is the counsel of the Lord. Be united together irrespective of your church affiliation. No church should promote itself. This is the work of God. No church can take any glory. No church should promote itself. Acts chapter 2 verse 46 tells us the New Testament believers were all united in oneness. Or what the scripture calls one accord. Now the word one accord, I looked up in the Greek dictionary, it gives a very interesting meaning. The one accord means they were fiercely passionate about and they were unanimous in one mind, in one agreement. There was such a passion in them, which was very fierce passion, that they must have this promise that the Lord promised. So do you have that passion? You can just like a revival. Liking will not bring you anywhere. It's not like Facebook, you know, you click like and dislike. It's not like that. You, you click like on the promise of God for Australia. If you don't like, you click dislike. It's not like that. You must have a fierce passion that you can even do away with food that you want God. You want this revival, that which God has promised. You know, I tell you one truth. Do you want me to be truthful? When the worship leader led us to sing the song, We Exalt You, as we all were singing the different languages, I just quieted my heart in oneness to worship that song. To sing that song, not just sing it for the sake of singing, but brought all that is was within me into oneness and my mind into oneness to worship the Lord. And when I did that, I found my soul translated and I stood in the heavens and I stood among the 24 elders and one of them came to me and he said, Tell these people one word. They are in a momentous crossroad in their nation. The whole of heaven is watching the decision that will be made in this nation concerning the plebiscite. Heaven is watching. And whatever decision you make, it will correspond with a decision that will be made in the council. You know, let, let me be very candid with you. In my experience so far, 
have visited not all places, not even many places. One particular place, a council, where many Old Testament prophets are. And that council very specifically oversees all the end time events that are going to take place in these last days. So because it is connected to my call, I'm always uh, a witness to the deliberations that are made in the council. And frequently I've been there, but this is the first time I was among the 24 elders and they said, we are watching the decision that this nation will make. If they make a wrong choice, severe natural calamities have been determined to come upon this nation. You know, I was really scared when I heard that. The reason is because in 2015, when I went to speak at a conference in Houston, when I stepped foot in Houston airport, the word of the Lord came unto me that this city will be destroyed with a massive flood. Now that has become history now. But before that event, while I was in ministering in a Chinese church conference in Los Angeles, the word of the Lord came unto me concerning massive earthquakes that will destroy California. Not only California, three major places in the US. And within a span of 10 days, I received these terrible messages that really made me very sick inside me. And I kept on crying unto God with one question. I said, Lord, why? Why such severe judgment over this nation? There are so many praying people, so many wonderful churches in this nation, so many revival meetings taking place all over this country, so many great prayer intercessors are in this country. In the midst of that, why? So that was the question I had. The next day, oh no, that very evening, when I landed in uh, Sydney, I mean Houston, another speaker who came with me to the conference, when we met together for dinner, he asked me, did you watch the news this evening? I said, no, what? Anything news, I ask him. He was scared when he told me the Supreme Court just passed the same sex marriage bill. And then I understood why the Lord spoke about such severe punishments. And now you know the Houston flooding is history. And they say the governor in the state of Texas says it will take years to rebuild Houston. So this is the same word I heard from the elder in heaven. If this nation makes a wrong decision, severe natural calamities have been determined to come upon this nation. And that will be very disastrous. You don't want bushfires all over the country. You don't want flooding. You don't want any typhoon or hurricane to come and flood this nation. Or you don't even want an earthquake. You, you know, that was shown to me. An earthquake will strike this nation. So I say this to you with trembling in my heart. Please take this call to pray seriously. If all of you, you gather in Maru, you fast and pray for those three days, your tears of intercession, 
can move the heart of God. And like what Pastor Jose received the word. And God will dispatch millions of angels in answer to your prayer. And those millions of angels, one angel for each balloting citizen in Australia. Can you imagine that? There are millions of balloting citizens in Australia, right? So millions of angels will be released in Australia. A sign, one to one. And they will stand beside each balloting person and whisper into their hearts or into their minds the purpose of God. What they say will appear in an individual as thoughts, good thoughts, that will move them to what no. On the other side, there will be a demon to move them to what yes. Now your prayers will sustain the angel to move these people to what no. A good scriptural reference for you is found in Daniel chapter 10. Daniel prayed for 21 days. And the angel Gabriel came. When, as soon as he came, he told Daniel, the very first day that you prayed, I was sent from God. The very first day. Then why did it take him 21 days to reach Daniel? Because there was war in the heavenlies. He was detained by the prince of Persia. And the war is real. He was detained for 21 days. And, and on the earth we read, Daniel continued prevailing in prayer all 21 days. He did not stop until Gabriel came. His prayers sent Michael. And Michael came and broke through and released Gabriel to go and bring the message to Daniel. So, your prayers must be a breaker through. Please, don't take this lightly. You are in a crossroad. The scales that came when we began this conference. God put a scale here on this stage. And he's been there from the first day till, till today. And that scale, this nation is on the scale. It can either tip for good or tip for bad. Now God chose to speak to you and to show you what you should do to inherit goodness from God. He has shown you. So all of you who have heard this word are now accountable before God. Yesterday afternoon, we took a roll call and practically everyone from every part of Australia is represented in this conference. Every state is represented here. Even Tasmania is represented here. Which means the whole nation is now either guilty or without guilt. You cannot say, Lord, I don't know. Even if there is one person here from a state, you are a representative of that state. And your prayers, your broken heart, your fastings will move a ton of angels to be dispatched to your state. You know, one shall put a thousand to flight, two shall put ten thousand to flight, right? Wrong. That is Old Testament. In the New Testament, the scripture says innumerable angels. Innumerable. No count. All for one person.
So you must take this very seriously. Whenever there was a crisis in the Bible, entire nations, including even little babies, they all fasted and prayed. The mothers refused to give their milk to their babies. The babies will be crying in one corner. It doesn't matter to them because what mattered to them is the destiny of the nation. They pulled their, school, their children out of schools and they were all on their faces before God. The animals were fasting. That's what moved God's hand to bless Nineveh instead of destroying Nineveh. Because everyone, even the poor cats and dogs and rats were fasting and praying. They were all crying unto God. The king himself came down from his throne and sat in sackcloth and ashes. Perhaps your prime minister will not do that. But the leaders of the church, you can do that. You can sit in sackcloth and ashes and you can mourn for the sins of this land. Now, please remember, if the word count was yes and the bill is passed, even the righteous people in this nation will suffer. So don't think you will escape. Even the righteous will suffer. Your children who go to the public schools, they are going to learn about gay lifestyle. And they will come back and ask you, what is a lesbian or what is a homosexual? Or what's a transgender? What are you going to answer them? Are you give, going to give them a teaching on biology? This is around the corner. Your children will be taught to go into a girl's toilet. They say this is okay, alternate lifestyle. So a girl and a boy in the same toilet. Now they are going to grow with that. They are little ones, you know, innocent ones. They wouldn't know any different when they are small. But they are growing with that sensitivity to that subject. And they'll grow up with the thinking that this is normal. And that will promote a nation of gays. An entire nation will become gays. When that happens, Satan will rule your nation. God will be kicked out. Because they will then be setting up temples for balls, altars for balls all over the country. Your nation that was dedicated to God will be trampled upon. So you're not like India, you know. India has been dedicated to so many other millions of gods. You have been dedicated to the true living God. Am I right? You have been dedicated to the true living God. So when you have been dedicated to the true living God, how can you allow the heathens to run your country? How can you allow that? You must now during the next three days put your foot down and say enough. Every one of you should have the spirit of Elijah upon you. You should rise up with the spirit and the power of Elijah and say, it is enough! Enough! You are going to pray until you break through heaven. Not only the word count will be no, but even your parliaments gay lawmakers will all be thrown out. Yeah. 
and righteous lawmakers will come into office. You know, you can do that. You believe that? You can do that. Your prayers can do that. Your united prayers can do that. It can take a man out of office and bring in a godly man into office. God will do that. In Daniel chapter 2, it is written that it is God who appoints kings and sets up kingdoms. He is doing that in answer to your prayer. You will have a godly, spirit-filled prime minister in your country. Every governor in each state of Australia will be a born-again, spirit-filled believer. Before too long, the prophecy of Smith Wigglesworth will be fulfilled in this nation. It is in your hands. Now let me tell you the other prophecy that was spoken about your nation. In the year 2009, the great prophet of God called Bob Jones, have you heard of Bob Jones? Is a true seer prophet of God that America has seen. Very unassuming, humble man of God who walked in love. An evangelist called Chris Harvey. Have you heard of him? Okay. He was asked by the Lord to go and visit Bob Jones. So he made an appointment with Job, Bob Jones and he met him. And as soon as he introduced himself, saying that I'm an evangelist from Australia, Bob Jones looked at him and he said, okay, now you keep quiet, sit down. I will tell you all about you. And this is what Bob Jones prophesied about Australia. Australia is spiritually asleep now and God is about to wake her up. A spiritual Woodstock, an event of rock and roll festival in the US. Do you know Woodstock? So which means you are more than 50 years old. A spiritual Woodstock is going to start in Australia. The church will not be ready for it. The thrust of it will come out of free worship and it will go to the open fields because buildings will not be able to contain it. At its peak, there will be 1,000 salvations a day. <coughs> 1,000 salvation is not recommitted Christians. First time born again Christians. 1,000 a day. It will spread from Brisbane through Sydney right around Perth then to New Zealand, England, and the rest of the world. <coughs> so Brisbane seemed to be well favored by the Lord. That is why God has moved our brother Neville Johnson from Perth to Brisbane. A billion souls will be saved in the Western world through this awakening. A spirit of true repentance will come upon Australia and upon the ministers. They will begin to weep uncontrollably as their hearts melt under the compassion of God. You know, for that to happen, God will pour out the spirit of grace and supplication. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. When that spirit is poured out, 
that's what will cause you to beat upon your chest, fall on your face, and cry out unto God. Now, this is a very recent prophecy spoken about Australia eight years ago. And you all know very well that the number eight represents new beginnings. So this year, 2017, is a new beginning for you. Amen? That is why at such a time as this, this conference has been organized just a few days before the ballots are going to be mailed out to every person in this country. You know, this conference was planned last year. It was not planned after the government had announced about the plebiscite dates. This was planned last year and God moved the hearts of the committee of this conference to pick the right dates. It is God who put in their hearts those dates so that his people can be placed in a position to alter the destiny of Australia. It's in your hands. Amen. Amen. 